Okay, this is the first video lecture uh, for the makeup class on Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, I am picking up here uh, where we left off in class on Monday the 19th. We were going over uh, these hypotheticals that are in the book on page 154. Uh, the, the overall purpose of these hypotheticals is to just get you to look at uh, some of these exceptions uh, for um, criminal defendants and criminal cases uh, to these character rules that are back in uh, Rule 404A2. Uh, and the, the last one we have to do is number five. So remember we have our barroom brawl uh, and, and someone is killed, a victim is killed, and the defendant is charged here in this murder, uh, but the defendant is using a self-defense defense here, okay? And so we, we know uh, that there are potentially some aspects of character evidence, uh, admissible character evidence, that this criminal defendant might be able to take advantage of. Okay, so uh, the last one here is this. After the judge has admitted evidence about the bad reputation of the victim for violence, which was uh, number one, remember, uh, we know that the defendant actually can offer that if it's relevant, uh, and it's relevant here because the defendant is claiming self-defense. So the, the judge admits that evidence um, but now the prosecutor wants to offer evidence of the bad reputation of the defendant for violence. Okay, bad reputation of the defendant for violence. Now the defendant hasn't offered yet any evidence of his own good character. We know that in, in the earlier part of the rule, uh, if somebody offers evidence, if a criminal defendant offers evidence of his or her own good character, we know the prosecutor can counter with a bad character witness. Uh, but what about when the defendant only offers uh, bad character evidence of the victim, but doesn't offer good character uh, evidence of his own character? What then? So the answer to this hypothetical is that uh, that yes, the prosecution in this situation can offer evidence of the bad reputation of the defendant for violence. Okay, and this is there in Rule 404A 2B, as in boy, double letter I. Okay, this particular provision was added in an amendment in the year 2000 uh, because um, the, that year, oh, I'm sorry, uh, because that year the revisers of the rule decided that it really wasn't fair for a, def a criminal defendant to put in um, bad character evidence about a victim uh, without allowing the prosecution uh, to retaliate with, uh, you know, evidence of the defendant's bad character for that same trait. Okay, so the things that are there in this uh, rule, these exceptions, I think just really... Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is this excerpt uh, from the Park uh, Treatise that's there on page 155. I think this is a really good uh, note that does a good job of going over, recapping, explaining this perennial difficulty with distinguishing between inadmissible specific act character evidence to show action in conformity therewith, right? And inadmissible habit evidence under Rule 406. Now, habit evidence has been allowed for a long time, going all the way back uh, to the common law. And by the way, don't forget that habit evidence uh, can obviously be a habit of a person, uh, but under Rule 406, you can also use that rule to get in uh, evidence about a routine practice of a business or organization. In fact, 
it's right there in the text of Rule 406. So, distinguishing between habit evidence and character evidence is definitely not easy. I think uh, I've already made that clear in class. And as this piece suggests, uh, specificity of the stimulus and regularity of the response to that stimulus are the two main criteria of uh, habit evidence, of whether something rises to the level of uh, being appropriate to be called a habit. Okay, so to qualify as a habit, ideally, the action, the uh, specific act that you're talking about should be shown to be a specific, repeated response to a particular situation or stimulus. But there's certainly a lot of fuzziness in this definition. And in a particular case, uh, what I've found is that it seems like if a court thinks that there is sufficient need for the evidence, uh, that court might be uh, generous to a fault, possibly, uh, maybe even overly generous, in using this habit safety valve to let that evidence in. Now, some commentators have looked at the case law on this uh, and think that courts might be taking into account what the proponent of the evidence needs to prove, right? How pivotal in the case is it? Uh, so maybe if a proponent's entire case really depends on showing this action and getting it into evidence as a habit, if he needs to show that the person must have acted in a given way because it was her habit, then um, only extremely regular response to something specific should qualify. If it's that important an issue in the case, uh, certainly uh, evidence scholars would say, look, because of the uh, powerful nature of this evidence, if this is a pivotal uh, part of the proponent's case, boy, judges, you should look very, very carefully at this to make sure it's a specific uh, stimulus and a regular response. On the other hand, uh, people have commented that, well, maybe if the proponent only needs to prove that the person might have done the action, that it's plausible that the person acted in that way, maybe more variability should be allowed. Um, now that idea is by no means a major theory. Uh, certainly the best I can tell you is what I've already said in class, which is that habit determinations are all over the map. <coughs> the advisory committee notes, for example, uh, use this uh, example of stepping off moving trains as a possible habit that could be admissible. Uh, but the Halloran court in the Halloran case uh, that you're gonna read probably wouldn't agree with that. Now, the advisory committee note also mentions this concept of being a heavy drinker, being a heavy drinker, not rising to the level of habit to show intoxication on a specific day. But I will tell you that courts have nevertheless allowed that. So if you see something like that on a hypothetical, you're going to want to argue it both ways while probably still mentioning that, you know, maybe the better uh, interpretation there is uh, to be more strict about the specificity of the stimulus and regularity of the response. Okay, and as I mentioned in class already, the fact of whether these acts rise to the level of qualifying as an admissible habit under Rule 406 is one of those 104A determinations by the judge uh, by a preponderance of the evidence. So that is in the hands of the judge and not, uh, for example, a 104B determination where you leave it to the jury to decide if something is a habit. Okay, let's just talk briefly about this Halloran versus Virginia Chemicals case. So we had plaintiff here, the auto mechanic, suing the manufacturer of a can of refrigerant that exploded and injured him. Uh, at the trial, the defendant company uh, wanted to pretend, uh, present testimony to show that this plaintiff had frequently used an immersion heating coil, immersion heating coil to heat the cans of refrigerant uh, to make them flow faster into a car air conditioner uh, when doing this um, air conditioning, uh, you know, a fix. Uh, and that he was doing that despite warnings on the can's label that this method was dangerous 
uh, and not recommend it. So the trial judge excluded this evidence, and on appeal, the defendant said uh, this was a mistake, the defendant company. Now, you saw the Court of Appeals did reverse here, and they reversed here saying, look, this should have qualified under the habit exception. Uh, they essentially say, look, even though evidence of just general carelessness uh, or some carelessness in the past is generally inadmissible to prove conduct and negligence on a particular occasion, evidence, evidence of habit or regular use, usage involving a repetitive pattern of specific behavior might be introduced if relevant, right? So the plaintiff in this case had presumably used thousands of cans of this refrigerant while servicing automobile air conditioning units. So it only makes sense to assume that he probably followed a pretty, uh, uh, a pretty steady routine in his work, right? The routine that the defendant alleged, including negligently heating this refrigerant with the immersion coil. So in the appellate court's view here, uh, this is a specific enough uh, repeated practice that it should have been uh, admissible under this habit rule. Uh, now, how does this court distinguish this kind of habit of evidence to show negligence? from the other two examples it gives in the opinion, which it says would not be admissible to show negligence. So let's talk about those. Those two examples are a person's habit of jumping on streetcars while they're moving, that's the first example, and a person's habit of looking both ways before crossing railroad tracks. Now, this court specifically says these two would not be admissible to show negligence or lack of negligence on a specific occasion. So I wanted to point out how the court makes that dis distinction. It does it there on page 160. Uh, the court here says, look, using this immersion coil is something the plaintiff was in complete control of, right? Complete control of, as opposed to the other two examples, which this court says would vary with the attendant circumstances. Uh, for example, um, you know, whether there was a train coming or, uh, you know, the issues of, well, how crowded is the street and what's the situation with the streetcar? Um, you know, the question that I have for you is, well, do you really buy that distinction? Uh, you know, I, I, again, I think that, that it's easy to see how fuzzy this whole area is. I mean, I would say, uh, for example, the idea of stopping and looking both ways at railroad crossings, how is that gonna vary with the attendant circumstances? I mean, if you cross and look both ways, you do so to, to ascertain whether there is or is not a train coming. Um, I would think that if that is a habit of yours, you would do it the same uh, every time. So I would say, at least personally, I thought that example was, uh, was not maybe as strong an example as the streetcar uh, one. But you can sort of see by that how courts, uh, as long as the rest, uh, as well as the rest of us, uh, struggle a bit with uh, whether something should be appropriately defined as a habit or not. Okay, so the last two uh, things I'm going to do on this video are to go over the two casebook hypotheticals, uh, number four and number five, that are on page 161 in the book. So you might want to pause the video here uh, and take a look at, uh, first of all, this number four, and then also when I switch the slide, stop and take a look at hypothetical number five. Uh, before listening to my explanation. So uh, starting with number four, this is an interesting one, uh, an interesting one that, uh, you know, you really have to think about what is, is uh, this evidence being offered to prove here. So I, um, I think the book has these as just letter D and letter V, but I added actual names because there's a lot of names in this hypothetical. So, uh, okay, so Drake is charged with the murder of Vlad. Drake's version of what happened is that Vlad, who lived in the same apartment building, was visiting Drake when an argument developed and Vlad took a karate stance and sprang at Jake Drake, and that Drake then wrestled Vlad to the floor and stomped his foot in Vlad's stomach. 
Vlad died from the injuries to, to his abdomen a couple weeks later, right? So Drake is claiming self-defense here, admitting that uh, he was in this fight with Vlad, Vlad, but saying he had no choice because Vlad attacked him. Okay, so now to rebut here, the prosecutor wants to argue uh, basically two categories of testimony that I want you to consider uh, separately. So number one, wants to offer the testimony of another person, Brad, that about two months before Drake's fight with Vlad, he, Brad, and Drake had a drunken quarrel and that Drake kicked him in the ribs, causing him to be hospitalized, uh, and that Drake, in fact, pleaded guilty to assault and battery there. Okay? Okay, that's the first piece of evidence. The second one is the prosecutor wants to offer the testimony of another guy named Chris, that he was a longtime acquaintance of Drake, the defendant, and that a year before Drake's fight here with Vlad, Drake and several others knocked him, Chris, down without a reason, and that Drake then kicked him in the stomach. So the prosecutor says, look, I'm offering the testimony here of both Brad and Chris to establish Drake's modus operandi of using his feet in fights, using his feet in fights. Drake makes an irrelevancy objection and an inadmissible character evidence objection to all of this pro a proposed testimony. So what results? And you've got several options here. Admit both pieces, admit uh, one but not the other, or don't admit either. So you might pause uh, the slide here because I'm going to go on to the answer. Okay, so for those of you who uh, answered uh, number four, that the objections to the evidence should be sustained, the evidence kept out, I agree with you. And the main reason for this is that modus operandi evidence, signature crime evidence, right, that is offered almost always, if not always, to show identity of a perpetrator identity of a perpetrator, right? But is there a question of identity even raised in this case? No, because Drake actually has admitted here that he had a fight with Vlad, that he was the one who kicked him in the stomach, right? But claims that he acted in self-defense. So the question is really as a threshold matter on what disputed issue of fact can some, uh, you know, a common scheme or plan or modus operandi of using your feet in a fight be relevant? None, right? Common scheme or plan, modus operandi, signature crime, almost always, if not always, used to prove identity of the perpetrator, right? On the other hand, evidence that Drake had two prior fights in which he kicked his victims is relevant, really, only to prove his disposition to commit violence assaults and use his feet, right? And that he acted in conformity with that disposition and assaulted Vlad, okay? Uh, and evidence, as we know, of a defendant's commission of prior crimes, not admissible when this is the only theory that gets you uh, relevancy. So this is a good example of really how necessary it is for a trial judge to make the correct analysis of the disputed issues of fact in the case uh, and what evidence uh, is being offered for there uh, because absent very unusual circumstances, a uh, common scheme or plan or modus operandi, signature crime can, can only have relevance when there's a disputed issue as to the identity of the perpetrator of the charged crime. If identity isn't disputed and therefore not an issue, evidence that the defendant committed prior or even subsequent similar offenses uh, not gonna be admissible. Okay, so uh, the last one here, hypothetical five on page 161. Here uh, I have the plaintiff is Patsy, the defendant is Doran, and the uh, darn good bus company, all right? So Patsy sues Doran and the darn good bus company for damages for personal injuries suffered in a collision between a bus driven by Doran, the employee of darn good bus company, and a car driven by Patsy. So Patsy claimed that Doran failed to stop at a stop sign. 
uh, Patsy's lawyer calls William the witness, right, who uh, testifies that he's been a regular and daily rider on the bus driven by Doran during the six month period preceding the accident, but that he was not on the bus the actual day of Patsy's accident. So he says, I usually ride this route. That day I didn't happen to be there. Uh, and so now Patsy's lawyer uh, asks this question. So William, in this six month period where you were uh, riding this bus so regularly, uh, did Doran habitually fail to come to a stop at this particular intersection where the accident took place, right? And immediately Doran and the Dar Darn Good Bus Company, uh, their lawyer make an inadmissible character and inadmissible habit evidence objection to Patsy's lawyer's question. So the question is, should you overrule the evidence and uh, overrule the objection and admit this evidence, this testimony, uh, right? I mean, uh, presumably, uh, the plaintiff here is assuming that uh, the witness, William, is going to say, yes, he, he never stops at this intersection, uh, right? Uh, or do you sustain that objection and, and, and exclude it? So you should probably pause here and think about it. Okay, so I agree with those of you who chose uh, option number two here. Uh, I think these objections should be overruled. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, number one, sorry about that. Um, the objections should be overruled and the evidence should be admitted here, okay? And, and you know, really the question here is, is calling for habit evidence, not character evidence. Uh, if Doran had a habit of not stopping at a particular stop sign, this is some proof that on the day of the accident with Patsy, he didn't stop at this particular sign. Uh, so um, the idea here, if you, you know, chose number one, your argument is, well, as long as William's observations of Doran are such that uh, William is testifying to his habit, uh, you'd argue the evidence is admissible to prove Doran's conduct in conformity with the habit, even though William wasn't present on the occasion in question and didn't witness what happened on that specific uh, occasion. Now, you know, one uh, thing that the, the, this question, I think, is trying to get you to look at uh, is that second sentence of Rule 406. So I'd like you to look at that. Um, the second sentence of Rule 406 says, a court may admit habit evidence regardless of whether the evidence is corroborated, right? Or regardless of whether there was an eyewitness on the particular day in question to the particular event. So there's two issues raised by that second sentence in Rule 406, and I think this question was trying to get you to look at that. Uh, so the idea is the evidence of habit can be just testimony of one person, not corroborated by anyone else, right? And evidence of habit can be presented even if there weren't any witnesses to the actual event, right? Um, the day that the Freon exploded in the Halloran case, right? No one saw whether the mechanic used the heater, the immersion coil. And in this hypo, the witness testifying about the bus driver's supposed usual practice wasn't on the bus the day of the accident, so didn't have anything to offer about that day ex itself, right? Not an eyewitness. Um, on the other hand, uh, to me, this question, you know, isn't a super clear answer here. This also might raise uh, the distinction made in the Halloran exploding uh, Freon case. Uh, remember that the court there was making the distinction between proving negligence with a habit carried out in a situation in which the person has complete control, right? Habit evidence there would be admissible, uh, but with a supposed habit that necessarily varies in response to outside circumstances, that court at least said the evidence might not be admissible. So the argument for those of you uh, who chose number two here, who wanted to exclude it, you know, you might say stopping at a stop sign or not stopping fully at a stop sign, frankly, is necessarily going to depend on whether there are other vehicles blocking the way, other vehicles that have the right of way and that are in the intersection. Um, so 
If you were following that uh, court's rule, this might not be admitted, and you might have chosen number two here. Uh, the other thing, uh, did anyone else think of the issue that, wait a minute, people who ride public transportation uh, don't tend to pay that close attention to whether the vehicle comes to a complete stop at stop signs or not. Now, I suppose this could be considered something that should go to weight of the evidence or maybe should go to credibility and not admissibility. Uh, but the determination by the judge here about habit is going to fall under Rule 104A. So the judge does uh, have to find by a preponderance of the evidence that the evidence presented here is enough to rise to the level of habit, something done consistently and automatically. Uh, so again, if you were thinking along the lines of the Halloran opinion, you might say, well, because the other presence of other vehicles, pedestrians, and so on on any given day uh, you know, change the circumstances, maybe this shouldn't qualify as habit. And then the last one, um, obviously it's still going to be uh, subject to a 403 analysis since this is a pretty uh, big issue in the case. Uh, so, you know, the 403 analysis is going to be done also by the judge in terms of uh, whether it should, should be admitted. And again, maybe the strength of the testimony, the strength of the evidence might affect a judge's decision on Rule 403. Uh, and then I, I suppose I would add that a, as a juror, I would probably take this kind of testimony with a grain of salt because I would know from my own personal experience that I don't always uh, notice whether public transportation drivers are um, stopping at stop signs. All right, that's the end of this video lecture.